On the occasion of yet another truly freaking wintry weekend when it is way too cold to fish and I do not know how to ice fish, let us bask for a moment in our collective love for the Weather Channel. Now, in telling you that I love the Weather Channel, I have to disclose that apparently we are owned by, by the same parent company, which has no consequences for me at all. But honestly, I would tell you that I love them even if they were owned by Satan. I love them. I'm thrilled to have any connection to the Weather Channel, even if it's immaterial to my life. Last fall, the Weather Channel took it upon themselves to start naming storms in winter. You know that hurricanes have long been given names by weather forecasters, but the Weather Channel wanted to expand that good thing. And so, although it caused quite a stir in the meteorological, com meteorological community, uh, the Weather Channel is now naming winter storms as well as hurricanes, which is how we got a winter storm with a cartoon fish name here in the Northeast last month, taunting me over not being able to fish in this weather. The folks at the Weather Channel kind of have a point with this, right? I mean, if we're going to name hurricanes, why not name big storms all year long? First of all, naming things is fun, but it also has a function. It makes them more easily definable as distinct entities, and that can be important when you're talking about a series of things that, in memory, can sort of all blend together, unless you have a way to remember their distinct characteristics. It analogizes well to what we do when we cover politics. Here in cable newsland, our seasons, of course, are not demarcated by the calendar, by the rotation and orbit of the Earth. Our seasons are demarcated by the endings and beginnings of partisan control over certain institutions in Washington. So our current political storm season, as I think of it, started in January 2011 when Republicans were sworn in to take over the House of Representatives after a particularly good midterm election showing. In this season, that started January 2011, there has since been a whole series of political storms, crises, calamities. It would be easier to keep them in perspective if we had not just thought of them as a series of things that all sort of seem the same in retrospect, but if they were all individual, rememberable things. Maybe if we had been naming those things the way that forecasters name storms, and the way the Weather Channel now names storms in every other season too, it would be easier to remember exactly what happened. The first crisis of this political season came in early April, after the Republicans were sworn in in January. That storm came in the form of a threatened government shutdown. Everybody called it a government shutdown crisis, which is what it was, a shutdown just barely averted by a last-minute spending deal. But so as to not confuse that particular government shutdown crisis with every other government shutdown crisis before and since, what if we just named it like the first storm of the season? What if we called it Aaron? Starts with A. Then the next crisis in the season of Republicans controlling the House came about three months later, in July. That was a debt ceiling standoff. Uh, we will call you Bilbo. Your name storms alphabetically, right? So you need a B. A couple of months after the debt ceiling standoff, Bilbo, we had the other government shutdown fight. Not to be confused with the earlier one, which we named Aaron. This one was the third storm of the season, so we will name it Carlito, which starts with C. Then we got a break from political crises for a while while we had the presidential election. But right after the presidential election was over, we got right back into the storms with the fiscal cliff crisis. And everybody struggled so mightily with the cliff as a metaphor. It would have been much easier if we'd just named it. Starts with D at this point, right? So how about Deirdre? It has been a very political storm season already. Already we've had Aaron, Bilbo, Carlito, and Deirdre. Four named storms have come and gone. And now, just three months after the last one, we are sitting in the middle of the sequester thing, which I declare henceforth shall no longer be called the sequester. Let us call it Earl. We need a name that starts with E, and Earl is rememberable. Seriously, half the fact that nobody cares is that nobody can remember the word sequester, and half of the people who can't remember sequester cannot spell it, and the other half cannot define it. The sequester crisis? No wonder nobody cares. Henceforth, we shall call it political storm Earl, the fifth storm of the season. Earl, in fact, is expected to be a damaging storm. Economically, Earl is expected to cost hundreds of thousands of jobs, jobs in every state in the nation. So far, the Republican position on Earl is that it is going to be devastating. And also, woo, let's do it. Bring on Earl. Look at this press release from the Republicans' re-election arm in the House, the NRCC. You see that they refer to Earl as a storm that will, quote, cut devastating segments of our economy. It is a devastating sequester. If you ask the Republican Party, if you ask the NRCC. At the same time, though, 
They are denouncing the potential damage as devastating. Also, quote, House Republicans could not be more pleased with their leader right now. Republican aides say privately that John Boehner sees no need to negotiate. Republicans are in a good place, they argue, because they want spending cuts, and those cuts are happening. Congressman Mick Mulvaney of North Carolina saying, quote, I think it's working to our favor. Congressman Steve Scalise of Louisiana calling these, those, those erstwhile devastating cuts, quote, a big victory. So that's what's happening right now. That's Earl, the sequester storm. It is major blind across the board cuts that start taking effect now that were purposely designed to be a bad idea for the country so we would be so alarmed by their onset that we would do anything to avert it. We stopped being alarmed, and so now these things designed purposely to be a bad idea, to be awful for the country, are now happening. The Congressional Budget Office says it will result in three-quarters of a million jobs lost this year. Republicans say that will be devastating to the country, and also that it's working to their favor. It's a big victory. Between those two things, they have naturally decided they would like more, and they have therefore moved on to planning the next two storms. So if this has not been enough, they have already got two more storms brewing offshore. Another potential government shutdown slated for later this month. We will need an F name for that one, so in honor of Kevin Spacey, we will call that one Francis. Uh, And then Republicans are psyched for another debt ceiling crisis that's scheduled to hit around May. We'll need a G name for that one. We will go with Gertrude. Even as they acknowledge that this current storm that we're in right now is, in their words, devastating, Republicans are delighting in the storms that they are planning for coming weeks and months. Ruth Marcus, writing for the Washington Post this week. To listen to Congressman Paul Ryan is to understand that the country should brace for a months-long slog, from sequester to continuing resolution to, yes, another debt ceiling showdown sometime this summer. Really, I ask? The debt ceiling? Again? I thought Republicans were determined to avoid replaying that losing hand. Not this time, Paul Ryan said, before the words were even out of my mouth. Paul Ryan already gleefully planning for the next debt ceiling standoff, the next storm, Storm F and Storm G, Francis and Gertrude. What does it mean for us as a country that this is our weather pattern now, that this this is how it goes now? This is what governing is like now. What does it cost us? And is this going to be the defining feature of the second term of the Obama presidency? Joining us now is a man who has spent a significant portion of his career covering real storms. He once explored the idea of lashing himself to a tree to cover one Texas hurricane early in his career. He has also weathered a lot of proverbial political storms in Washington over his long, storied career in network news. Uh, Dan Rather, did those pictures make you feel bad? (laughs) I think they're great. Dan Rather is now anchor and managing editor of Dan Rather Reports on Access TV. Thank you so much for being here, Dan. Thank you for having me. Um, it, It seems like... Um, the self-imposed economic crises that we faced before um, were not flukes, that it's the planned way of governing from here on out. Has this happened before in modern American history? Not exactly this way. We have had government shutdowns before, but I think this is historic in this sense. Uh, It's going to be slow to build, but it may last a a long time. And the thing that strikes me that's different about this one, frankly, neither side at this moment seems to know whether to bark at the moon or wind their watch, mm. which is to say they don't seem to know what it is, that how this will resolve itself. The Republicans are sort of doing their equivalent of an end zone dance right now, but it may be premature. But, you know, I, I keep thinking if you're a soldier in Afghanistan in some lonely post, moment to moment on the razor's edge of danger, and you hear or you see on your computer... The government is in a shutdown mode. The U.S. government is in a shutdown mode. What, what must they think? What must the Chinese think while they're smiling, if not indeed smirking, saying, this is supposed to be a better system than ours? Now, for the American public, what it does, mixing our metaphors here, it forces the public to drink deeply again from the chalice of cynicism mm. of neither side really has the country's best interests at heart. They have their re-election chances and the uh, fate of their party at the time. But not the country. What differentiates this from... Well, let, me, let me stop sure. you there, though. Do you think that... Do you think that is substantively true? I mean, what, what we saw is the Democrats were able to pass 
the, their plan to avert the sequester, in the sense that it got 51 or 52 votes. Right. The Republicans filibustered it. The president has said, I would like to avert the sequester with this balance of tax cuts and, and, and spending cuts. And the Republicans have said, if, unless we get everything that we want, we, were not, we are not going to do anything. Well, there's no doubt from uh, any objective analysis, which is very hard in the current partisan political mm. environment, but any objective analysis, this is something the Republicans wanted. Yeah. And they're getting it. It is not something that President Obama wanted. In fact, he certainly doesn't want it. A great deal of what it's about, and let's see it for what it is, the Republicans want to stymie the second Obama term. And they see this as a plan, one crisis after another, one chaotic period after another, will freeze him in place and, in effect, ruin his second term, which in, indeed it could do, mm -hmm. uh, keeping in mind the effect on the economy. Uh, what's missing from that equation is well, what does it do in the country in the meantime? 750,000 people are going to lose their jobs, according to the CBO, based on what just happened. If that's if a good start, because maybe those people will all vote against whoever the Democratic nominee Well, here's is, one solution Obama. that occurred to me. You know, if we're looking for a way out. I give you an Oklahoma guarantee, which in my part of the world is a rock-solid guarantee, that if you said, okay, the sequester is now in effect, that means that no member of Congress, no member of the Senate, indeed nobody at the White House is going to get paid. We're going to throw all these other people out of work. They, a lot of them are not going to be paid. So until and unless it's settled, you're not going to be paid. I guarantee you, give you Oklahoma guarantee, be over day after tomorrow. One thing that I, I was thinking about when you mentioned China there is I worry about not just national security, but all sorts of calamity that can happen to our country in, in surprising ways and our ability to be resilient in the face of real challenge. Because we keep imposing these crises on ourselves, I mean, talking about the soldier in Afghanistan looking back in this, why is the government shutting down? Did something happen to make that happen? No, the government just decided to shut itself down internally. So there's no externality that caused this. While we are tying ourselves up in these knots on purpose and self-imposing this harm on ourselves, self-imposing big economic harm on ourselves if the CBO is to be believed, does it actually make us less able to deal with any eventuality that comes up externally? If something bad happens, either in national security terms or in some other, some other, some other way that's important to the country, are we less able to deal with it because of this? I think so, at least marginally and perhaps more than that. I think the answer is yes. Mm. Because, you know, we put ourselves forward as the model for the world. Uh, we have a uh, republic based on the principles of freedom and democracy. We know how to make it work. Now, what we're saying to the world, we can't make the thing work. We can't make it work for us, so why should anybody else look for us for leadership? don't want to overstate, but I think the answer to your question is yes. It diminishes our ability to influence events in the rest of the world, and particularly when it's something unforeseen or something down the road. Let's remember, Iran is still out there trying to build a nuclear weapon. North Korea is still belligerent. All these problems exist, so something could explode at any moment. I do think that it makes us a little less powerful, if you will, a little, little less uh, with an ability to influence others because they look and say, listen, you can't even get your own house in order. Don't be telling us what to do. Dan Rather, anchor and managing editor of Dan Rather Reports, which is Tuesdays at 8 on Access TV. It is always such a pleasure to have you, Thanks, sir. Thank you very Thank you, much. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks for having me. All right. So everybody uh, today is very head up about the fact uh, that I said something on The Daily Show last night which was impolitic. I acknowledge that it was impolitic, but I meant it. Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, I said last night on The Daily Show, behaved like an Internet troll during the oral arguments over the Voting Rights Act this week at the Supreme Court. Do you want to know why I said that? Hold on. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. We do not give up. Expect surprises. Subscribe.